All right, we are live. Hello, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. Marshall, you're going to talk. You want me to? Uh, you can. You, you can, can talk. talk. All right. Well, welcome to Q and A with Alan and Marshall. Except now it's Alan, Marshall, and Richard. Unless you're live at Long Beach, then it's just Marshall and Richard. Everybody wave. Right. Everybody wave. Yeah. You're, you're, we're live. We are we're live. live. So we want to welcome everybody from the Long Beach show. Hope it hits a great show for you so far. Going to be. I wish I could be there. Um, we're going to wait for some people to jump on live here. There's, uh, and we'll uh, take comments. So this right. will be live Q&A. So comments are always needed. So they can't hear anything. Uh, not at the show. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. We can't hear them. So the folks here can't... Oh. The folks here can't hear what's going on. Uh, I, I got an echo now. So you guys can't hear what's going on. So uh, sorry. <laughs> we haven't mastered that part of the technology. So let me just review the rules, what's going on. Is that this is a Q&A show. Uh, we have a live broadcast that Alan Howe with Easy Way and I do every Friday. Who here has actually watched or listened to that before? Right, thank you. It's a lot of fun, okay? But we're uh, we're going to do this show live, and we're live right now, okay? And what, we, how it really works is that you guys give us your questions, and we're going to answer them, okay? So we don't have a prepared slides, none of that. We're here to help you. We can do anything about your process. <laughs> and bring their questions to you guys, okay? So what we'd like you to do is if you're going to have a question, there's an X on the carpet right there in front of the microphone, just stand there. If you wanna listen in, just put the headphones on. There's a microphone, just pick it up and ask your question. And then we can uh, bring you into the show. Just introduce yourself, where you're from, what your shop's about, that type of stuff, right? So, uh, does anybody have a something to start with? Tell Marsha put on his headphones. You, you could, yes, if you have headphones. It's called Q and A with Alan and Marshall. And uh, if you go to the Ac uh, Marshall Atkinson on YouTube, uh, Atkinson Consulting on YouTube, you can find it. Just look me up, and it's live right now. And and you're you're on the show. <laughs> Atkinson? Yeah, A T K I N S O N. Richard, are you there? Yeah. Tell Marshall to put on his headphones. You have to put on your headphones. All right. So, do do you have any questions from the audience, from the the virtual audience? Yeah. Uh, Rich, so uh, we have some people watching. Just so the people know, uh, you can tell them we have Charles Juros from New Mexico watching. We have Gosta from Uppsala, Sweden, that's online right now. Right. He's let me, let me, let me tell everybody what's going on. So live right now, we have uh, Charles Juros from New Mexico watching, Kisa watching from Texas, Gosta is watching from Uppsala, Sweden, David Eggers is watching from uh, Wisconsin. Josh Wiley is watching from Oklahoma, and Peter Walsh, m &R, is watching from Chicago. So uh, we would love it if you guys would uh, step up. Who's got a question that you'd like to get some problem in your shop or what you're doing? We're here to learn, right? And, Al and Alan, who's virtual, and I and Richard can help you solve that, right? So, but you got to be brave enough to ask the question. Dave Edgar's is Anything that you're struggling with. No takers? Come on, people. Okay. So uh, let's get some uh, questions from you guys from the virtual audience, and let's get the ball rolling. 
We have uh, one person, Tom Rollins says, go to the Shirt Lab booth at 2017. There's a shameless plug. Um, if you're watching. Uh, Dave Eggers is actually at the Long Beach show. We have Justin View, who says hi from Vietnam. But Justin, you're not in Vietnam, I don't believe. Okay. That's view, I know. Um, so, ask the people right. that. How many of them are screen printers? Um, all right. So Peter Walsh wants to open up the discussion on shortages of skilled labor and supply chain issues. So uh, does anybody here have a comment on that? You'd like to participate in the show or, or Alan and uh, Richard and I will talk about that, right? Um, so Richard, what's your feeling on the supply chain issues and how you think things are gonna shake out? Well, I, I don't know that they're going to shake out um, if people haven't understood it so far that we can't live in the past. Now, this is something that I heard uh, originally from Mark Kudre, he said it on one of the podcasts that he's done the last six months, that unfortunately we are the bearer of bad news. Every client, every person that you meet at dinner parties, for instance, I've been asking, are you having supply problems? So I did it with a framer the other day and a, a construction worker. And every person in every industry that I've discussed is having certain problems. When the Uber driver is driving, they're having their own problems that they can't get people. Uh, you can't buy a used car these days. You can't buy used equipment. So everything is dried up. People are having to stay home because of their children. Uh, schools are a, a big problem. It, it all works into an inferno. So the idea that we're going to get out of this quickly seems incorrect, but it's people that can move with the times and not live in the past. So it means that the people who used to order from the San Mar catalog and, and have delivered to contract printers, 11 different designs, five different colors, all different sizes, we have to now charge for that because now we're doing all sorts of other contract work. So it, it depends if you're a labor seller or if you're a custom contract printer, you need to sell what you know you can get. So, if you think, take a wartime mentality that we all know you can't get it all. So the, the people that are upset, well, I can't get the hats that I want. That's correct. Welcome to 2022. That's not, that's very cynical, but it's been two years. You sort of need to wake up. Yeah, that's good. How many people here have had issues with the supply chain where just about everybody, right? Right. And are you ordering sooner? Are you getting your customers to try to uh, understand what's going on? Are they receptive to that? Are they, there's a lot of pushback? What, how, how are you guys thinking about that? Marshall Notes got his headphones on with their own echo. They have, they're having problems in their own industry as well. Right. It's, it's, when we explain it to them, it makes perfect sense because they're right. dealing with the same problem. Right. So, uh, what's your name, sir? Brandon Mills. Brandon Mills. Uh, and where are you from, Brandon? Las Vegas. Las Vegas. All right. Uh, I was saying about everybody has the, their customers have their own supply chain issues, and that feeds into that also. And they they understand, right? And I think that really kind of uh, helps explain things. But I think one of the things that you really have to be cognizant about is having a process, having a plan, really mapping things out, and uh, and really getting people on your side by explaining what's going on. I know tons of printers who've actually, you know, did a screen capture of like, you know, let's say you're trying to order a particular shirt brand. You can show them the inventory with all the zeros by it. And then what will happen sometimes is they'll go, well, if you can't get it, it just goes to somewhere else, right? Well, somewhere else can't get it either, right? So you just have to really kind of educate your customers more about what's going on so they're on your side, okay? Um, so Charles Juros from New Mexico, he wants to know what causes a ghosting effect on a portion of an image and what can you do to correct that? And uh, I'm assuming that's like the slight blur you get when you print. To me, that's a screen tension related issue. Uh, what, what do you think, Richard? So everybody take your hands, put them in the air. Give me a hoo-hoo. It's fun, it's fun. Now, 
if you take your index finger and move the skin on the back of your hand, that's a loose mesh. So your squeegee comes down, it draws in one direction and bing, like a bow and arrow, it snaps back before you've lifted the mesh out of the ink film. Now, make a tight fist. And now you'll find that, oh, the skin doesn't move so well. So we've had a little Botox treatment there. Or you started listening to Don Newman, who showed me that in 1981. Who uses retentional frames? Right? What do you guys have your frames ratcheted it up to? You're over 30? Uh, no. Uh, I think our shop is 19, 24. Okay. So With retentional frames? Yeah. Are you talking about okay. those? Uh, frames? Uh, yesterday, Charlie, that it's significantly too low. Yes, that's why I was shocked at S19 with the residual frames. <laughs> okay, so uh, what, what's your name, sir? Uh, Seth from Anchorage, Alaska. Seth from Anchorage, Alaska. Hey, you met, who here has traveled further than Seth to be at the show? Right? Probably nobody. Maybe so, somewhere in Florida. Yeah. Alabama. Yeah, from Florida? Alabama. Alabama, that's uh, pretty. I don't know. Alaska's way up there. I'm, I'm closer <laughs> than that. I'm from Detroit. So uh, was talking about using retentional frames, but he's only getting 19 on his uh, screen tension, which is kind of low, right? So um, get together with Wendy Sandfelder on the show floor, or see me afterwards. We'll we'll help you with that. Right, right. Um, so Cindy King says we have to New Richardson close most of the accounts. Uh, I guess you're talking about the supply chain issue, right? Uh, who here is trying to find Richardson hats, right? Who's hoarding all the Richardson hats? Uh, you guys back Alaska. There? <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, those are going for some good money, I hear. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Richardson was there, and uh, I went up and asked, beat up? I'm going to ask you the question that hey, can, can you? About. Would you mind stepping up the microphone and talking? That'd be great. No, you shouldn't have to touch it. Just walk. Talk. Hey, Richard. Oh, yeah. oh, last week I was at PPAI in Las Vegas. Richard, and Richard I'm there. Marshall, you should keep your headphones on. Just hey, you need to pick that up. Sorry. Oh, really? And I went to one of the sales uh, sales people there, and I, uh, I asked him, you know, your what, on. and everybody else is asking about inventory. And they had this new, uh, this new thing on their website that uh, – you could look up the, the production and and you can get in the waiting line for for the different hats and so like if you're one of the particular richardson 112 you know in a certain color you can get on that waiting list it might be six months out but uh but but they've got that that was their solution to uh to a lot of people just not having anything available right All right thank you brandon yeah. awesome awesome Right, so uh, anybody else have a question? We'd love to get you guys to participate. I know you're scared. <laughs> right, um, yeah, can you come up come and ask up. it? Well, it's yep. really just more about you guys. Forgive my ignorance, but I don't know if you guys are. Who are we? I want to know like, what your background is. Yeah, and what you, speak in the microphone. Um, you can speak it up, yeah. yeah. Like what you guys, to give me some sort of context about the questions right. that I might ask. Yeah, sure. Uh, and like who you guys are, and what you do, and right. That's where great. You hey, good question. We should have introduced ourselves better. What's your name, sir? Will. Will. Great. Thank I you. We're at TNT in Houston. Okay, great. Tell so, Richard, so I want you to go first. Who are you, Richard? Uh, I'm Richard Greaves. I've been a screen printer since 1979. Started in the flag business, and then ran away from from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Partially, uh, you have to keep them on. Created a. a uh, a cut and sew uh, house in North Carolina, and then in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. Everybody's heard of Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. We moved there because they had the best dye house and stuff. This is all in the early 80s. Made a name for myself in full color process. Met Don that's Newman, right. worked for Don Newman. So you that's see. why I have D uh, Newman tattooed on my butt because I'm a die hard Newmanite. Um, I've worked for Lawson Screen Products. I uh, worked for Yolanda as the product manager. That was my last job. And I've traveled all over the world consulting. So I've been almost everywhere except Alaska. So I've been in the business for 40 plus 42 years. Yeah, and I'm Marshall Atkinson. I've been in the industry since 1993. 
I got into it, uh, kind of backed into it like everybody else. Uh, I was, uh, before that, I was working on my master's degree in architecture and was uh, printing t-shirts to pay for graduate school. And uh, I got sucked into the screen print mafia and that's about, you can't, once you're in, you can't get out, right? And uh, so I was an art director for 14 years and I was a person who always said, hey, there's a better way of doing something, let's figure it out. And then they put me into operations I became the vice president of operations and ran the back of the shop. I got interested in Lean Six Sigma and sustainability and that kind of stuff. Um, and then I went and worked for a, a, a different company in uh, Wisconsin. Uh, and we had, I was the chief operating officer there and we had 16, 100,000 square foot shop, 16 autos, 160 heads of embroidery, three coordinate DTGs, all running on two shifts. Um, you know, millions and millions and millions of prints. So I've done a lot of both uh, were contract printers that really service the promo industry, but a lot of high volume, a lot of crazy demands and uh, unforgiving clients. <laughs> so uh, I've, I've, done a, I've done a lot and I haven't done it all because nobody has, right? But um, that's kind of my background. Uh, and I am currently a consultant. I've been consulting since 2010. Uh, full time since 2018, kind of my side hustle before that. And so I do uh, process improvement and uh, workflow and leadership and that kind of stuff. But I also have a company called Shirt Lab, which is a sales and marketing uh, company. And we do live events. We also do virtual events. We have a booth down on the floor. Come see us. Uh, booth number 2017. Uh, and we're, we've got a photographer. You can get your uh, social media headshot updated. <laughs> That's kind of our draw today. And uh, we're all about helping and making making this industry better. That's kind of what we kind of what we do. So, all right, C come on up. Step right Make up. Make sure you introduce yourself too. Okay. Oh. I'm Jessica from All Quality Graphics in Sacramento, California. Um, my question is about reclaiming machines. So we're finally at the point where we're going to take the plunge and purchase one. I know you guys can't endorse any particular brand, I'm sure, but I just kind of want your advice on which one to go with. We're kind of torn between the Lotus Holland and I'm drawing a blank on the new guy with the, it's a little single train one. It takes about 30 seconds to go through. Mm -hmm. Probably hopefully know what I'm talking about, but any chance to give me feedback on what would be a better purchase. We're doing about on average, I'd say 50 screens a day. Um, and I know that's not a ton to need the reclaiming, but we're in California where labor is high. So for us at pencils, right. Richard, you have an opinion on that? Um, where in California, Richard, is she at? Where in California are you? Sacramento. Sacramento, she said. Okay. So she's, I'm going to repeat this. I'm going to take this question if that's okay. Right. So, so we'll repeat what Alan is saying. Alan Howe in Michigan. And that would be the way. A known chemical troublemaker. And I, I, only heard, <laughs> I only heard part of her question. So the good thing what is. What is our recommendation of a reclaiming unit? Three so screens a day, she said? 50, 50 a day. 50 a day. She's on the border there where she can start looking at auto reclaim because it's not about just a late. I think that's what she's talking about an auto reclaim. Oh, okay. Um, she mentioned Lotus Holland and another company that has a smaller one. So I know that Hydro Blaster has yeah. one that they showed at the Fort Worth ISS show. Yeah, there's, um, if she'll go to this booth, we don't make a reclaim unit, but they can, rec we, we work with all of them. For her, I recommend you go to the Easy Way booth 2003. Okay. Um, <laughs> and I'm sure you're supposed to go to GSG. The sponsor right. of our yeah. uh, yes. broadcast. So you want to in Texas. So here's the thing we're looking at. Look at screens per day, which she has, which is awesome. She has to know her footprint. It's not about the machine. It's always about the chemistry in there. And remind her that it's all about pre-prep. Underexposure will make any screen, any chemical fail in auto reclaim. Right. Stop, stop there, Alan, so we can relay that. Go ahead. So, so uh, we want to know how many, you really want to look at how many screens a day that you're doing. 
and uh, what what are you failing at? Uh, you know, the screens are failing, or something's going on. And uh, what chemicals are you using? What chemicals are going to go in the machine? No. That's what you should really be kind of like focusing on. Right. Um, so uh, the shops that I run, we went into doing a auto reclaim system, and uh, I would suggest that you do some time studies. Uh, how long does it take you to do it manually with your dip tank or however you're doing it now? What is your chemical consumption? How many hours are you spending doing it? So you can extrapolate the labor data, just throw all that on a spreadsheet. And then you can compare when you automate that, you should be looking at some sort of savings, right? I think we have all that down. And my real question was the Lotus Holland where you're loading several screens versus the new one that just came out where you're doing one screen at a time. Yeah. What would be more advantageous at that? Like, well, the, the advantage of one that you're loading all like it, you you can put a couple in the hopper is that you can walk away and do something else. If you're doing one at a time, you have to constantly be coming back, so you have to look at your workflow. And to me, that's going to be how is your screen room area laid out, right? So it's kind of like a like an you have an auto coder where you coat the screens. No. Okay, so an auto coder is the same way. You can like put the screen in and zip it up, and it's you know it's coating the screen while you're exposing or taping up or whatever you're going to be doing. You can be doing something else. It could be the same situation with an auto reclaim unit, where if it's like just a single screen at a time, you could be reclaiming that screen while you go off and do something else instead of loading several screens into the process and then doing it right. So just think about how much more time could you be going and doing something else? And at 50 screens a day, that's, you know, that's a, that's a good number, but it's not like it's 300 screens a day, right? right? So, Richard? So uh, that was my point, that you only have 50 screens a day. You take 435 minutes in a working day, divide that by 50. I, I didn't do it in my head, but that's maybe one every 10 minutes. I'm, I'm only guessing. Uh, so it could be less, so it could be eight or seven minutes. So you put it in, it takes 10 seconds to put it in and send it through, and you have to come back in seven minutes or come back in 14 minutes and then do two of them. Um, yes. So it's not like you have a large amount. And so the, I don't see a reason to, to stack in bunches of them because you'll be able to do 50 screens a day, one every seven minutes. I and think, it doesn't take that long for them to go through. Alan? I, I think stay with the Lotus Holland size because if it asks this question too, 50 screens a day is what she's doing. How many does she need to do? Is there a lot of, lot more well, that could be? So Al wants to know if you're only doing 50 screens, how many should you need, do you really need to do? Is like, it a hundred? I mean, you're gonna you go to 150, but should you be doing 65 and you're 15 screens a day behind? Yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely more. Alan yeah. pointed towards the Lotus Holland then. Yeah, I don't like the ones that do one screen. No, we had a we had a Grunig. It was a big. It was huge. They came out pretty clean. So it just depends on how long they sat, right? And uh, sometimes you just have to. We had a bucket with a brush with some product in it. Sometimes we would hit it again and spray it out, and then it was good, right? So. Just really the, the important thing with any of these machines is that your chemical is right and you don't like uh, there's a tank reservoir. Right. Like I would recommend just like you do with your dip tank, you mix the concentrate and everything and whatever you're, the, the foaming agent and everything into a like five gallon bucket. And then you add that to the reservoir instead of just like filling it up. And you have to pay attention to that because if you dilute the product in the in the uh, machine, the machine is not going to clean like it was supposed to, right? So you really, and then the other thing with these machines is you got to make sure you change the filter often because you don't want pieces of tape and whatever to get into the pump because that's a serious issue. There's going to there's going to be an half hour of cleanup every day, maintenance on the machine, and just like with early inkjet direct to garment machines, they didn't do the maintenance. And then they, they just thought it was going to be a magic inkjet printer that would print everything perfectly. So there's still a lot of maintenance. But also think about if you're underexposed, that the machine will not solve that problem for you. 
because underexposed screens, counterintuitively, they don't reclaim easily. Right. And that's what you're going to have in the corners and areas where the emulsion was thicker and built up that it didn't reclaim as well. So your whole system has to work because it just does it the same way every time. And people that have a problem, and I've never been in a shop where you didn't get things that you had to fix them afterwards. So it's not it's a mag not a magic wand. It's a good helper, not a magic wand. And, and you're not using screen opener or any other crazy thing that's going to cause problems, are you? Try not to. Devil. Oh, you try. <laughs> you try not to. We know what that means. That's Don't what I have to try. Yeah. Don't try do with screen opener. Don't try do. Yeah. Um, also, tell her too on a percentage of any machine, we like to look at like 85%. Uh, where you shouldn't have to touch up. Um, hey, give uh, uh, Richard, give him that comment real quick. Alan says that you want to make your 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 average is going to be that eighty five percent you won't have to touch up. Now fifteen percent you'll have to still touch up. You still got to have a pressure washer. Still got to have a sink. Yeah, machines don't have eyes. Is the reason machines don't have eyes, and it will show you where you're where you're lacking at in your screen room. It will definitely point you in the area that you're lacking. So if you're having big problems. Or you're having problems. You have to. Get, there's a reason for that earlier in the pre-press. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So consulting with your chemical company and your emulsion company. And we're good there. It's just you know, nobody wants to wash screens. That's the problem. Well, it's the worst job in the shop. Yep. Because you're doing. That's why it pays. Right? That's why it pays well. So let me tell you, the best person for that is your most anal or tentative people. There's people actually who really get a lot of joy in using a pressure washer and cleaning sidewalk because they think, wow, this is really cool. Pew, pew, you pew, find pew, that pew. <laughs> Will, you had a question? I do. My first job ever when I was 16 was a dishwasher. When I started at TNT, I was cleaning screens. I was like, this is just like washing dishes at the restaurant. And it was like very satisfying. So <laughs> I, I enjoyed few screens. There you go. Yeah. Uh, my question is about uh, squeegee density. And I'm a relatively new printer. I'm trying to figure out, is there a best density for a certain situation or is it a matter of personal preference about what works for me? Or I don't know if that's if that's a question you can answer. Durometer. Is there, what's that? Yeah, squeeze Durometer, Durometer is what the man said. Durometer, yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, exactly. So I, I'm sort of ignorant to that. And I'm like still trying to figure out what's best for certain situations. Okay. Is there one or is it a matter of preference? Right. Good. Good question. Richard, you want to take this one? This is up your So end. The, the blade needs to move the ink. And so I come from a snow area. You're from Sacramento. You've never seen snow unless you went into the mountains. But you have something that resists the blade. So the ink cannot win. So heavy globs of cold yeah. ink this morning when it was only 65 degrees out. So that's a cold morning. And when the blade hits it, it can't be slowed down. That means you need stiffer blades. Now, people are afraid of stiffer blades. They've also used to manual printing, where they're used to getting in there, making sure the ink gets through. So I kick myself because they didn't bring it. But imagine a roll of one inch tape. Inside, I used to put my watch or a wedding ring. And I then took a blade, a squeegee blade, and asked people like you in the audience, now, I want you to get my watch out of this roll of tape using the squeegee. And that's what your squeegee's doing. Press hard. Press harder. No, no, no. Wait. No, bend it. Bend the blade. Oh, oh. Will, come out over here and press on my shoulder. Let's go out and drive a car over the roll of tape with my watch in it. You cannot make the ink come out of the stencil with pressure. All you do is bend the blade. So... A little bend is good, except why didn't you set your angle that way in the first place? So in the world-class squeegee picking, stiffer is better. So 80, that's pretty extreme. So 70 durometer with a 90 durometer center to make it stiff and a 70 lip, a 70, 90, 70. Some people call it a dual durometer because there's two. Some people call it a triple durometer. We'll never settle that argument, but the most popular blade by from is a 70, 90, we have, 70. A, we have a comment from Mark Saldanic on it. If you like an 80, I want everyone, everyone to take a left front chest job 
just like the one that I'm wearing here, and you print it with a putty knife. What, a putty knife, Richard? A metal, or get a plastic one at the dollar store if you're a chicken, but take a metal putty knife, and you'll be amazed at, oh, it prints. You need the soft loop because you don't want to scratch the mesh. Uh, you can't use, you could use a flood bar. If you've got an automatic press with a regular flood bar, print with a flood bar. If it scrapes the ink, that's what moves the ink. The ink is turbulating. It's moving. All the molecules are broken loose from themselves, like a ketchup where you hit the back of the bottle. And it flows like motor oil. It's multi-viscosity ink. Green, Richard. And the, and the ink can never beat the blade. Alan? Look at your screen. Mark Soldonic just. Yeah, Mark Soldonic. Mark Soldonic, that guy. Right? He's got, you oh, he's from GSG. The, uh, GSG he's... videos. You should watch those. It's, they're dynamic. He says uh, 70, 90, 70 for top colors, 60, 90, 60 for bases, 70 for single colors, and 60 for specialty uh, glitter. And that case. would be shimmers. Glitters, I would go down to a four. Shimmers. Yeah. 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 So uh, I think that the important thing is that you experiment, right? What's going to work for you? And then uh, look at your screen angles, right? Look at the pressure. I think also it's the tension of your screen. It's your off contact. It's all that. It all adds up together. Yeah. It's the physics of printing. Also, we're using a sharp squeegee, right? That has a lot to do with it also. You should be just using that edge, right? Because uh, you don't need... You don't print the side of the blade, you print with the edge, right? So you have to look at that as well. Yeah. The blade never touches the shirt. There's your degrees that you need to be, zero to 15. Zero to 15 degrees, Alan adds in. How did I comment? Is that you, Alan, commenting? Because you, you have mind control. <laughs> awesome. I think that's what I like about printing so much. Is it, it could be any one of like 20 different things, and it's like, such a critical thinking. Can you speak the microphone? That'd be great. It, it's, I'm just commenting. It's like such a critical thinking activity. Figure out which little thing is it that's making my print wrong or right. Right. There's always a test you can make that will help you get to that judgment. And it's just a matter of comparing what you did, then you make a change, the scientific method that you should have learned in the fourth grade. Right. Cool. Who else, who else has a question? We have a question from Sweden. Oh, Swedish question. All right, we have a question. For, hold on. We have a question from Gosta Carlson. Come and sit Sweden. in front. Come on up then front and sit in the chair. So do you see a trend and take more local produced products, even though it's something totally different than I had in mind when we come to you, right? So he's talking about sourcing things. So in Sweden, I guess, uh, you know, they're going to have supply chain issues just like we do, right? So do you have access to locally sourced stuff? Uh, when I was running a shop, I always tried to get all my chemicals blended, press wash, that type of stuff, blended locally to save money on the transportation and that type of stuff because they can blend that stuff just like anybody, right? You can give anybody a sample and the local company can make the stuff for you sometimes. So um, that worked That worked really well. Um, so I, I think also if you're looking at garments or boxes a lot of your supplies you can probably source locally if you but it really depends on where you live you know i don't know how much that's available in anchorage alaska right you have to probably bring everything in there sweden's probably the same way right so um right thank you ghoster for that question carson so, carson you have a question i do uh i have a question about like a four inch uh squeegee for like sleep prints yep I'm having a tough time when I'm using it and not fully bending and not applying the ink through the screen. Uh, is that well? It shouldn't be bending. So, like, the pressure need to be super low, or is there like an accessory, like an extender? That are you printing manually or with auto? Auto. Okay. Three. <clears throat> How does the screen know that it's printing on a sleeve with a four-inch blade? It doesn't. How does the ink know? It wouldn't. So that's not meant to embarrass you, yeah. but it should be no different. Now, is the does a four inch blade go over the edges of your platen? Yeah. yeah. It yeah. needs to be so a shorter. Never. Blade. You never want it to go over the edge, like on the table here. Uh -huh. You never want it to go over the edge because you will then immediately start to crease and score the screen. That will break down your screen and 
two hundred prints easily. On your garment also. Yeah. Okay. So, so the, the blade probably... needs to be less than the the uh, the plat. So now imagine what would happen if I'm, you know, the, the blade is going to bend because it, when it goes over the edge, it's going to lift up the middle a little bit. As you're pressing down and pressing down, it's going to curve because of the way you bend it. Practice with your hand mm -hmm. and you'll see it. I'll bet you it lifts in the middle because the, the blade is a beam and it, it will bend based on where you're, you're grabbing. So it may be an S beam, but uh, the, the biggest problem you have is the blade cannot be wider than the platen. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think the squeegee is to the drummers too low when the squeegee blade gets that short, it loses its stiffness. That's what I think. So. It, well, I, I disagree. The man said that if the blade is short, it loses its stiffness. So um, blades are measured by durometer, which is if you poke something into it, like you poke into my stomach or you poke into a pillow, and there's amount of force that you're pressing down with. And it's, it's a resistance force. So if I punch with one pound of pressure or 10 pounds of pressure, so it's the resistance of the blade. And it's the body of the blade. You don't, you don't poke in from the bottom. It's not the bending angle. If you took a 12 foot two by four, little Jennifer, eight years old, can bend it. But you take a 12 inch two by four and Samson cannot bend it because you don't have the leverage. So we all have two inch blades with a three eighths, uh, three quarters of an inch grabber uh, uh, in the handle and you have a certain amount that sticks out. That's your diving board, your cantilever that is sticking out. If you're bending the blade, you're sort of defeating the purpose of the blade. You're changing the lift because you have set it at 15 degrees like they told you to, but then you press, 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 and now the lip is probably at 45 degrees. So that's your finished blade angle. And that's what's squirting ink through. And if, if you're bending the blade that much, is it floating? I live in a wintry climate. And so you can float when you hydroplane across water. Or if you're surfing with a, 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 a one of those little boards that you go with the shoreline, on one inch of water, you can skitter across the top. So if the blade flutters and goes up, are you finding a clean scrape after the blade? That's all you need because you can't get any closer because I'm pressing, pressing, press. how can I get any closer? Once you touch, once I touch, I can't get any closer. Marshall, stand on my hand. You can't get any closer. Once you've touched, you've made contact. After that, it's all angle and speed. Speed is what will help make ink flow better than anything else. It is the best stirring action. It's the best viscosity reducer. You went to a clear base or something like that. You mentioned that in your, started to mention that in your question. That's, you know, put a lubricant in. The best lubricant is faster blade speed. And a lot of people tend to try to print slower, right? Because if you don't get a good print, they're going to print slower. You should, the complete opposite, you should try to print faster. And if your ink company tells you to print slower, look for a different ink company. And you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Print slower, Blanche. print slower, kill me. One show told me, I called them and told me to print slower. It was past week. Mm -hmm. I ended up having to print very fast. It looked way better. Yeah, it was like turned it up and get well, off camera. We make money by how many shirts we print a day, right? That's how you make money. You only make money when the shirts are in the box going to a customer. Right. So one of the things we should be looking at is your output. Right. And so anything that that slows that process down, that because a governor like an old truck where it's not going to go fast. Right. is something that needs to be looked at and examined and solved. OK, so I would be looking at your process and what you're doing. Remember, it's the physics. There's every action there's an equal and opposite action. So if you're trying to print and it's uh faster right it's it, the the the, the screen is going to snap back faster you're going to clean your print it's not going to be textured you know you get the little little bubbles what do, what do you call it alan um like what? the ice cake icing thing you know yeah. 
so oh, that's so caused by low tension. That's caused by printing slow. That's caused by the mesh like walling around like a pig in mud. And the ink, and then when it finally releases, right, it causes all that stuff, right? When you print faster with a higher tension screen, you get a really smooth print. Okay. Better. All right. Carson, cool. we'll see you next week. <laughs> where, is, where is Carson from? Carson, Carson where are you from, where buddy? From? Houston. 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 We'll no, no, you got to give me a company name. Company name. Alan wants to target you. TNT. TNT. Oh, oh, the whole TNT group. Oh, all right. Yeah, everybody right. has introduced so itself. Right Jason. Yeah. Jason Troning from Bemidji, Minnesota. Happy 420 merch. All right. I guess. I mean, we stay pretty busy, but always looking for new customers. And what have you found as some of the best ways of gaining new clients, I guess? Best ways of getting new clients? Well, well let me ask you this. Okay. Uh, do you currently have a business plan? Uh, no. Okay. Well, that's why you don't have any customers. I mean, I got customers. Well, I'm... you need to write a business plan. The reason yeah. why you need to write a business plan, if you ever been to a bar and shot darts or aimed a rifle at a target or anything like that ever in your life? Yeah. Are you, so you're familiar with the concept of aiming. <laughs> That's what a business plan does yeah. is it yeah. aims like a laser, like a high speed sniper rifle to your customer that you want to get because you're defining exactly who you want to serve and, and, and everything. How, where are they and what do they buy and when do they buy and how much do they buy and what do they need? What is their problem and all that? If you try to serve everybody, right? How do you market to everybody? So what I would do is I would write a business plan and might, you might have a couple little mini business plans, right? Because or a, a hospital, is going to have a different problem than the Harley Davidson dealership or a school, right. right? So what we want to be doing is we want to be solving problems. We're in the problem solving business. If you can solve problems, right? People will pay more for their problem being solved than they will than, a, Hey, I just need some shirts printed. You're now a commodity. If you're only selling ink on cotton right. or embroidery, whatever, we want to use our business plan to detail exactly who we're going after, our best customer, what's going on, what do we need, what do they need, um, how do we find them, all that kind of stuff, right? So that's it's really important. So uh, uh, SBA, Small Business Administration, has a business plan template that you can get for free. SBA.gov, I think it is. It might be .org. Um, but it's essentially you're defining who, what, when, why, where, right? How, what is their problem, right? Do you, who is your best target, your best customers that you do business with right now? Who's your number one customer that spends all their money with you? Uh, be an artist. Artists? Yeah. Like, like painter, sculptor, artist? Yeah, and then, you know, sort of okay, so you're providing merch for the artists to sell. Are you doing online stores for them? No. Why not? Okay, right, so them. we want to, so you're, you're uh, the thing that I would be doing is I would be presenting an artist with a way to monetize their creativity, right? So your problem solving is not decorating that shirt. It's giving them money. You're handing them money, yeah. right? You've got a way that you can help them monetize things. Well, my best client, he can sell a lot of shirts on his own. He just needs the shirts made. But I mean, I see. The same okay. Thing with, well, like other uh, so people, with other people, I just would be for sure. Okay. You know, that would be a good thing. So Jason, yeah, people. exactly. So he just needs the shirts made. Well, guess what? It's just a commodity thing then. Yeah. Right. So you're just a, Hey, I just need the cheapest price possible. Yeah. Right. So maybe that's not a good fit for your customer. Maybe you need customers who only, they just want to have it. Somebody else does it for me. I they just give me a check every month for what was sold. Those are the customers that be a good fit. Just because somebody wants to do business with you doesn't mean that you should be doing business with them, right? right? And I would be doing a couple of things. I would be writing a business plan. I would be getting 100% of the money up front, right? I wouldn't do 50-50. I wouldn't do terms. I wouldn't do a PO. I would be, get, try to get all your money up front, yeah. right? I would be having really understanding the problems that you're solving for your customer, right? and build a process for that 
And then you can duplicate that with different customers. That's who you're going after, right? And if you can, like a target, like a bullseye, if you build that, then you know exactly who to talk to and where to go and what their problems are. And not only that, you have a solution for that. Yeah. We have a comment from Greg Kitson on this. Okay, so hold on. We have a comment from Greg Kitson. Who, who, who knows Greg? Who can't be here. I was emailing him today. Hey, Greg, we love you, buddy. We love uh, you. Thank, thank you for emailing me earlier this morning. So Greg says, if you don't write it down, it's not real. Business plans help you reach goals. And okay. it's not real. It's in capital letters. With yeah, It's not real. It's in capital letters, by the way. So you really need to be writing some things down, right? One of my favorite things is I have a, in my office, I have a four foot high, eight foot wide whiteboard and divide that up into two foot sections. In each section are different sets of goals and things that I'm working on. And it's right in my face all the time. So when I'm working, I can see what my goals and what I'm trying to do and that kind of thing. And it helps me keep pushing because it's visible, right? And when you write a business plan, you do stuff and it's in Word or it's in Excel or it's in your computer or whatever, the only way that you can look at it is to open that stuff up. But when it's sitting right there on the wall and you have to look at it all the time, it really pushes you to do more. Jeffrey Gittimer recommends using post-it notes, but it's mostly a personal thing that you might do at home. And his most important personal post-it notes are in the bathroom mirror. Now, of course, he has many bathrooms, et cetera, et cetera. But if you live with something that may be an irritation, my girlfriend, Gina, sometimes doesn't like the post-it notes I've got on my bathroom. The other thing is I recommend a very interesting book called The One Thing. It's padded with an awful lot of information, but listen to it as an audio book or something, the first five chapters get you into the right mood and spirit. After that, there's a lot of churning. It could be reduced to about half of what it is, but it will get you thinking about focusing on the one thing, reducing distractions. Because you need to focus on selling or, or going for clients and everything that takes you away from that because sales is the engine of your company. No sales, guess what? You're broke. You have the best equipment in the world. You need sales. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Who else has a question? Um, so kind of a follow-up on Jason's. You just said... Who are you? Uh, try hey, to can you introduce yourself to yeah, everybody? Yeah, um, my name is Seth Brown. We're a shop in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, kind of a two-parter. Um, you said to try to steer away from... Uh, like 60, 40 yep. or payment terms. We have a lot of clients on net 30 terms. Why do you recommend? Because you're, you're more you financially pay? strong. Sure. Okay. So when COVID hit, I can't tell you how many shops went out of business because their accounts receivable was crazy. Sure. 45, 60 days out, they never got that money ever and they were no longer in business. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you can get the money up front, okay. Guess what? You can you can buy the ink. You can pay your people. You can pay your bills. You can do all that kind of stuff. If they can't pay you today, what makes you think they're going to pay you next week? Okay. And guess what? Uh, let, uh, let me ask you a, a, a personal question. Are you are you a bank? No. Okay. If you're not a bank, why are you lending your customers money? Okay. So guess what? That's what Visa and American Express are all about. You, they can they can use their Visa card and they can pay the Visa card off next week. And guess what? Now you have your money. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I would recommend that you try to push that as much as you can. I fully realize that some clients will never do that. Okay. Well, then you have to decide, is this the client that I want? Okay. Gotcha. Okay. And then some, and then, and just deal with it because I know some people do stuff with school districts and that kind of stuff. But let me tell you, I know people that do stuff with school districts and they pay up front. Okay, that are in this business. Yeah. And and those same school districts, they buy from Amazon. They send the football coaches to the camp in another state. They had to buy the airplane ticket. They didn't put that on a PO. Sure. Right. So if they can do that for other people, how come they can't do that for you? Right. Yeah. No, that all that makes right? a lot of sense. Yeah. So it's just having the conversation. Richard, you have a comment? And you're in the custom printing business. When you print for them, when you print shirts up, alas. It's no good for anybody else. Sure. 
no custom, you get paid up front. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, kind of the second part to my question is we are a shop of nine in the winter and then usually like 16 to 18 people in the night. When is it um, not winter? Uh, and we, have, we have a beautiful, we have a beautiful summer. Uh, it's short, but it's beautiful. Um, usually about 16 to 18 in the summer due to our kind of busier season. Um, we're moving into a bigger space here shortly. Uh, Marshall, I think your background is in kind of automation. Yep. Um, a lot of the time wasted is just labor hours, man hours of inputting POs. Um, you know, everything through the pre press is very right. redundant. Yep. What is the first thing that you would automate? Um, well, the first thing I would do is I would uh, stop looking at equipment and figuring out what you want to automate. I would just I would ask qualifying questions to figure out what your problem is first. Right. right? So I would be measuring, measuring things. Okay. Right. And so you before you before you start trying to solve the problem, I want you to figure out what the problem really is first. OK, so you don't necessarily have to automate things. What you need to be doing is looking at the process, how long things take, what are we doing and what that type of stuff and figure it out because I can tell you that a lot of times the downtime isn't caused by I have an auto or I have a manual or I have a, a automatic screen coder or whatever. The problem is this, the information sucks, mm -hmm. right? And then you get one of these deals where um, uh, I, I'll often explain that um, a, a workflow in your business is like the Mississippi River. Okay, the headwaters of the Mississippi are up in Minneapolis, up in Minnesota, right? And it goes all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, right? That's your workflow is the river, okay? I want to imagine that that order is a paddle wheel boat on the Mississippi. And as it's going down the river, the workflow river, right? Anytime that boat has to turn around to go back upstream because your artist, the, what shirt color is this? Right. Anytime that you have to stop and figure something out, like, have you ever gotten goods in your receiving department? You had no idea what they were for. Right. Your paddle wheel boats going up river. OK, so what we want to do is we want to look at our process. We want to solve these problems. Right. And it may or may not. You might need new equipment. You might need to automate some things. You might need that. A lot of times the problems we have in our shop is due to information is the issue organization is the issue. You know, I went to, I do, I'm a consultant. I go to shops all the time. You know, I was at a shop once. Okay. And the accounting department completely digitized all the files and they had seven filing cabinets. They moved out of their office because they no longer need them. Where did they put them? They put them right there in the middle of the production floor. So now all these people have to walk around the filing cabinets all day long and the accountants, you know, what, what do we care? Right. So it's like, watch your people do things. Right. So observation, timing, how long do things take? Um, has so a Greg says, uh, Greg Kitson says, look for piles in your production loop, fix the piles, fix the problem. A really great book to read is called the goal. Okay. Right. The sure. goal. Or his favorite book, Two Second Lean, right? Read these books and do what they say, okay? And so uh, before you start looking at equipment and stuff and spending lots of money, I really think you should just, uh, like, Agreed. where's the problem first, yeah. right? And then you can, you know, like going to see a doctor, you know, you can diagnose the problem correctly. And then, you know, somebody on this per, uh, show floor will happily take your money. <laughs> whatever whatever you think you need okay yeah no, i appreciate that thank you when you no, fix the problem it's going to tell you where to automate you can't what automate problem? when he looks at the problem and finds where the piles are that's going to tell him where to automate yeah so alan says you, you look for the problem and look for the piles where the backlog is okay. and that's going to tell you where the problem is okay. you know typically in this industry i uh, take it you're a screen printer uh sales huh sales and operations so, no, your company, like you screen uh, print. Screen print, embroidery. And okay, prints, yeah. so uh, uh, the biggest workflow challenge that we have usually is the sales to art, to screen room, to production, Yeah, absolutely. that workflow, Yeah. right? It's also in embroidery, it's digitizing, you know, and we're, we're usually waiting on two things. We're waiting on goods to come in, which is crazy right now, 
right? We're also waiting on screens or embroidery to be finished, right? Uh, it, uh, to be ready to go, right? So look at those things. Look at the big, easy, low-hanging fruit first and, and, and solve that. And I think that, um, you know, you, you would, you'll get some traction on that. You might need a consultant, a couple consultants to go up to Alaska. You guys game? The book, The Goal, walks you through looking for bottlenecks. It's a story that's written as a novel. It's easy to read. I've been reading it continually since about 1984. Every year in January I read it. I have not yet gotten to reading it this year, but I read it because it's a great refresher. And it'll show you how you can spread the load because if there's a bottleneck, if all things are clogging the screen, there are ways to spread those loads. Automation isn't necessarily the only way. Spending money, you may have equipment that can do it, even though it thinks it's old antiquated equipment. So for us, it might be, yes, we got all these autos. It might be that cap should be done in a manual press or sleeve should be done in a manual press. Oh, but then it take all day. Yes, but it won't waste the time of the auto that's printing eight color stuff sure. while you waste automatic time printing one color stuff because it's faster. Yeah. What does it really mean to the throughput of all the work? The sleeves should not slow down. Mm -hmm. Still, you're not doing sleeves all the time. Yeah. Your so job is not the answer, okay. says Richard. Yep. So His another thing you might think is, uh, job is to make is how much, how much uh, money per hour are you trying to make with your equipment? When you have an auto or an embroidery machine or a DTG machine or whatever, right? What is your profit goal for that when that's running? Is it $300 an hour? Is it $1,000 an hour? Whatever that is. Name that goal, right? And then guess what? For every minute that it's not running, you can do the math on what it's costing you. Okay? And then you could go, well, I don't want to spend $6,000 to solve the problem. Well, you can annualize what the problem is and realize it's costing you $96,000 a year because you're, do you're inefficient in some way. And then it's an easy decision to spend the money. So okay. another way to look at things is look for downtime. Even if you spent money to hire someone to find, the, the, to do the timing in your shop, or to use something like uh, Marshall's production tracker to track the production time, once you find where the downtime is, you'll probably find that training is where you should be investing. And that if you do not have slides or video, we all have a broadcast camera in our pocket with our video camera. Richard, unmute. Oh, no, I'm he, not talking to here. What what happened? He said that I was muted, but I'm you're muted. muted. The computer's muted, but not. So Just lean closer to the microphone, Richard. Okay, I'll lean closer to the microphone. So, <laughs> um, where was I? So training, train once on film, you'll never have to train again, ever. Documentation. And you'll find it, oh, what a pain in the ass it is for the first week, but it will literally multiply logarithmically. And yes, hire someone because every 17 year old knows how to operate a video camera. And I don't care about value. That's where you go to two second lean, go to the chapter about me. <coughs> don't spend a lot of money on equipment. Everybody's got a broadcast camera. Don't worry about editing. No introduction. Hello, this is for the, no, this is for the, and then you barcode it with QR codes. Put the bar, QR code on the reclaiming machine or the sink, or the, how do I change the oil? Train once, yeah. never again. It's the way teaching should be. School teachers that teach sixth grade math every year for 50 years, if it's on video, you never have to do that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Who else has a question? Great question. Come up and uh, tell us who you are and where you're from. Um, my name is Pascal, and I'm from Houston, Texas, and I'm currently company TG I'm also doing DTF and my main question is she's a TNT like everybody <laughs> do you you've worked in an environment where you've had multiple print processes yep. you've had DTG running yes. and screen print yep. are those um, a process that you think are okay to run in the same environment if they're in the same Product, if they're on the same production floor sharing a space, do you find that the climate or any cross-contamination chemical that you sit in the air or anything is going to affect one or the other? Well, are using what? 
So the, the question really is about your uh, preventative maintenance program, your cleanliness, your hygiene of your shop, right? Yeah. Uh, how far apart these things are, you know? So if you're really expensive DTG machines right next to the screen room and you've got all the humidity in there, that could be causing some issues. So like screen, DTG needs humidity. So a lot of them have like a mister and built it like a cornice that's, you know, they have that in there, right? But too, control. too much is a problem, yeah. right? And uh, and so it's like a lot of times DTG really needs to be an environmentally controlled thing. I had cornets in the main shop that were just in the same environment as screen printing and embroidery, right? And it worked fine. So I think it really, but we worked really hard to keep the, the area maintained in one kind of the constant do you think it would be more effective to have them? Well, it depends on your equipment, right? It depends on your equipment and what you're trying to do and uh, um, and then how well you maintain the uh, everything, right? It sounds like you've got a specific problem. I'm, Tell trying, us to, I'm trying to pinpoint it. Um, intuitively, I'm, I'm finding it's climate control, but there's also factors like adhesive in the air i feel well, like why it, is there adhesive because you're using spray tech because yeah. you're doing fleece well Kill spray tech okay there, so it's, it's, the only reason would be fleece and all you have to do is build yourself a hood or something like that that can control that um i'm finding that my my dtg my dtg machine is marshall i just lost her marshall everybody's muted what happened I've lost you. I've just lost everybody. Richard, tell Marshall we have no if you guys can hear me, we have nothing. We just lost everything, Marshall. Can you hear me, Marshall? Richard, can you hear me? Richard, can you hear me? I'm trying, guys. Davis, I'm trying. That's on their end. Look at the screen. And I've been to shops where it's surgical room clean, right? It's what, I don't know what yours looks like. Okay. So, uh, but it could be causing some issues. Okay. Thank okay? You. Perfect. Thank you guys. You take a restaurant, they've got walk-in freezers and a bar has got a refrigerator. And so those are a way to separate supplies. Um, again, see me, you know, ask me afterwards, you know, we could, we could be more specific. Oh, and by lost, measuring that we lost the sound on the feed. Oh, we're back. Tell oh, them you're, we're back. You're muted. This thing quit. Oh. We're back. We're back. Tell them. Anybody never else got a question? Here? Richard, tell them we're good. Don't play with anything. All right. Step right up. Come right up. Take a seat and talk into the microphone. All right. Well, tell us who you are. Where you? I'm what shop? I'm from well, the Marshall, don't play with. Ah, I've spoken with several people there. Alan is a favorite of 
of your place or he yeah. likes your place a lot? Yeah. Richard. Well, he loves you, he said. Richard, can you hear me? I can't hear him. He's, he's muted somehow now, so we'll have to listen to the rebroadcast. Oh. You're muted, Richard. Are you muted? So, so our magical test... Te uh, Technical device here, Alan, uh, turned itself off for some reason. No, I haven't. <laughs> no, he's not taking the right, So please reintroduce yourself now that everybody can hear you. Okay. You came to talk about you, Alan. I said all about you. Uh, I'm Lindsay Carpenter. I'm with TR McTaggart in Standish, Michigan. And so we do a lot of print. I'm going to preface this. I know you're going to tell me time studies and all of that. The other th I'm looking for a cheat sheet at the thing to measure first. We do a lot for the tourism destination retail industry. We're doing a lot of smaller runs. These are not large corporations. We're doing smaller runs. I'm curious on um, the best approach to send things to the production floor, effectively how to schedule our production calendar. Is it by type? Obviously, we try and run sweatshirts all together. We're trying to run t-shirts, certain types together. But then we get into, is it best? You know, I get frustrated when I watch the press changing out squeegees and flood bars. Like, no, run all the inks at the same time first and they're like look it's faster anecdotally if we do it this way i'm like i swear to god if i watch you have these and then it's more work and reclaim so i'm just wondering if you have uh any direction where to start that conversation with our team as we you know get more well, solid data if you're trying to solve the production scheduling conundrum it's based on two things capacity and velocity right capacity let's just talk about averages right it doesn't matter decoration, embroidery, screen print, DTG, laser etching, whatever, right? Yeah. What do you average yes. a day? No, I'm oh, just, okay. this, okay. this, 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 hear me X. out, right? What do you average a day? And then let's say you had four autos. Every single one of them is going to have different numbers because they're different autos, they're different people, they're different types of jobs, they're different whatever, right? Yeah. So start tracking and averaging what they do, right? And then the other thing is velocity how fast are they doing it, right? And so if you know that your auto, for example, prints at 400 an hour, and you know, for example, that your uh, setup crew sets up at five minutes of screen on average, and if it's a 400 piece, three color job, you know that you're gonna be able to run that job in an hour and 15 minutes. So if you're trying to schedule that and you know your numbers, it makes it really easy to do. The problem, is the measuring part because that's such a pain in the butt, right? So come see me later at booth 217, 2017, because I have a uh, production tracker thing I can show you or after the thing where it, it helps you measure. And I don't want to sell you or anything, but you should you can do this with a piece of paper, right? Well, and we have ShopWorks. So I mean, we have production. Well, ShopWorks doesn't measure anything. You have to put the, you have to measure and put it in. I'm talking about you measuring. Okay. Okay. And so you can use uh, a piece of paper, you can use different things. But the important thing is for you to really understand what it takes. And we all know that some things that we print or embroider or whatever take longer to do, right? So uh, you're gonna run a hoodie slower than you're gonna run a t-shirt. You're gonna run a bandana different than a t-shirt or a tote bag different than a t-shirt. You're gonna do puff embroidery on a hat different than you're doing a flat, right? So what does it take to do this stuff? And then if you know these numbers, it makes it really easy to dial in your scheduling. Also, if you know your numbers, it makes it real easy to start working on continuous improvement. How can we gain an edge by solving something and being by doing different things, right? So like one of the things you might look at is um, stopping or doing something like, for example, I've been to shops where you only have one set of squeegees and flood bars, right? And then after every single job, they have got to clean everything before they can do the other one. Well, how much does that cost in productivity for the year? What if you had two or three sets? And then you had a guy who was cleaning all that while you were printing. Wouldn't you be making more money at the end of the day? But guess what you got to do? You got to spend a bunch of money buying two or three sets of squeegees and flood bars. But at the end of the year, you just made another two hundred thousand dollars. So does it matter, right? Right. The return so, on that employee is so, huge. So, sure. so really, just look at what is causing your problem, and and I would be um, 
observing. That's the, like when I, I go to shops all the time, like I spend the first day just watching, watching people work. What, a really great thing to do is do what's called a spaghetti diagram. You ever heard of that? No. So I want you to look, at, let's just say it's screen print. Okay. I want you to look at your lead screen printer and draw a circle. That's the press. And then every step he makes, I want you to start drawing a map of where he goes uh, when he's setting up a job, right? And Richard, unmute yourself. Richard, unmute. How come he didn't have that yesterday? Get an echo. Right? We so care. imagine you solve that problem. How many more jobs can you get out of day if everybody, the scavenger hunt, so what you got to do a day is already, it was done yesterday. And all we're doing is setting up a job, running the job, taking the job down. You know, this is for screen printing, for embroidery. You could set all your jobs up for embroidery and have all the cones of thread, have all the samples. You know, your embroider operator, operator you doesn't need to get the thread. Have somebody else do that. Can you hear me? Right. Tell Marshall to unmute. My short answer is there is unmute. no magic thing on Christmas, You're muted. Right. <laughs> right. There, I mean, I just, there's no single colors, multicolors, single, whatever it is. There's not a place to start. It's truly on right. capacity. Right. So I will share a couple of articles that I wrote in the early 80s in my column in Screen Printing Magazine. Uh, Life report card, money. Uh, they describe how you can... But you need to count, you need to count, start counting on your market set, go. We're now doing job 48192. It started at exactly 1.11 p.m. Setup time, how long? Da -da -da, job approved, boom. So in the beginning, you have to write it down on a chalkboard or something. Everybody's got a tablet. Tablets are $150 from Amazon, and you just find a way to track that. He's got a production tracker software that do that. Timeular, I'm madly in love with the Timeular. If you bought a Timeular cube for every printing, if you got four automatic presses, you buy four of them. Oh, gee, that costs $400. Yeah, so what? Because you'll make that back in the first month, I promise. But you need a way to track how much time we're sprinting. So then, gee, it took 48 minutes to set up a three-color job. Oh, you could get Henry Kissinger to set up jobs at, at that kind of rate. Because at 3 or $4 a minute, it costs $200 to set up the job. All your profit, gone. So international standard for setup is five minutes per color, three minutes for tear down. That's eight minutes per color. You get a three-color job, it's three times eight. 24 minutes tops. And, if they're, and that's because, like a pit crew at a racetrack, the tires are ready, the squeegees are ready, the inks are laid out. Who's laying the stuff out? If Warren is walking around looking for the – have you seen the screen? Have you seen the green squeegee? That's death. Anybody wandering around, two jobs should be stacked up for every printing press. Oops, I can't print this job. Fine. Push it out of the way. Get the next one in. It's MASH. Marshall, unmute. Call me. Uh, I can help. I can't unmute, Alan. It's, you're, it's, you're muted. The microphone isn't tied to the video. You're muted. Please no. So it could be that this thing is dead, and we've been working on our – Computers. Probably. Because when I might when I muted my computer, okay. oh. Alan yelled at me. It says Marshall's muted on his own. I can't do right. anything about it. Right, Lindsay, have you got did you have a follow-up? No, nope. so uh, the goal, the book that I mentioned before. Yeah, you'll have to read it or listen to it on audio tape. Uh, I mean, I mean any of the audibles, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And it walks you through tracking where bottlenecks are. It's the same problem they had uh, with Pascal. Did I get your name right? Or did she leave? It's the same, same kind of a problem. Where are the piles of stuff? Now, you had the climate problem. I'm sorry. Another problem. So did I answer your question? Well, no, because I want magic. Unicorn answer. Oh, the magic unicorn answer? Yeah. Right. Why are you telling me? You, know. you got to put the work in. <laughs> when you track downtime, the that analysis will you'll see immediately where your problem is, and that's just a matter of fixing that. So then you need a doctor. So you need diagnostics, and then you need treatment. And you have to do it with an open mind. 
right? So I'm sure in your life you've been to the doctor, right? So let's say that your knee hurts, but you're still getting your temperature and your blood pressure taken, and they're in a way, uh, and they're going to uh, listen to your heart, and they're going to do some things, and it's like, but my knee hurts. It's like, well, the reason we do all this is because what if you had high blood pressure and you have a blood clot that's causing the knee pain, and that's not like a muscle, right? So they want to rule things out. They're still measuring. So you should be measuring all your different things in your shop and just to see what do you do and, and form a baseline Right. And then when you improve things, now you know that whatever you did was working. Right. And, and uh, you can do it forever or you can just do it for a month. Right. So, you know, your, your choice. Right. But I, I would I would start there and start looking at what's causing your issues. And uh, and then also talk to you, the people that work for you and go, hey, what's broken? What if, if I was a, uh, you know, if this microphone was Aladdin's lamp, you know, and we rubbed the lamp and the genie popped out and to make your life better for what you do here at the shop, what would your wish be? And if you ask 20 people in the shop, you might get 20 different answers. But what if six or seven of them were the same? Okay. And, and I would, if you do that, by the way, I would suggest you having that question and answer session individually with people to avoid group think and then because if you do it in a group there's someone's going yeah what he said right but that doesn't really help you right and uh so just really being organized being clean working uh, who here has ever worked in a commercial kitchen right so you're familiar with the term meet someplace right that everything's in its place so if we're working in the kitchen and we need to add spices or onions to the dish, they're right here, right? We need to have that same philosophy in our shop because if we need the thread for a job for embroidery or we need the trimming scissors or we need a uh, razor blade because we're trimming the, um, uh, the, the pallet tape off, we shouldn't have to walk anywhere to get it. It should be right here. And we should have multiple sets for all our crews so everybody has what they need, right? But I'm in the shops where there's only one tape gun and they all have to share because the owner's cheap. I don't want to spend $10 at Uline for tape gun, right? But instead, what they're doing is they're funding the labor of people walking over here to get the tape gun and walking back. And you know, they could have bought 100 tape guns in a month just, you know, because of the labor they're saying. So that's Fresh just eyes. one example. Right. So you got to look at what makes sense and ask your people what how, how could we solve something? And I think that would help. Uh, hey, Alan, is my sound better? Your sound is better, but all of a sudden just you just started echoing for no reason. I don't well, know. Because that. the echo is because you I asked me to unmute. unmute. <laughs> you asked me to unmute. That's what you couldn't, but you couldn't hear me. No one could hear you then online. No. So, there. All right. Anybody else? Who else has a question? All right. But we're all good. Uh, hello. Tell them Jill. Hi. From Illinois, Southern Illinois, not Chicago. Um, I own AVH Ink and Vinyl. We screen print, re embroider, we do all those things. I have an auto, a very small, all electric auto currently because that's all that fit in our space. We didn't uh -huh. have a space we could have an air compressor. All electric. Huh? Nothing wrong with all of that. So, it, so it's a, a, like a Vastec? What do you? What it's do you a brown. Have? Brown? Okay. Yeah. Um, but we're looking to, now I have a much bigger space. We're doing higher quantities, higher volume. Uh, I want to do better quality work, but, and also faster and faster setup because the brown takes a lot of time to set up. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, it does. Keep registered. So we're looking at a new auto somewhere mm -hmm. in, and I don't know how much to increase. Uh, from going from like a, I guess we have like a seven station, six color, I guess, in the brown. And we're looking at an MNR Sportsman EX, uh -huh. I think was the one we were kind of looking at. Uh, so I guess my fear is going from all electric to something that requires an air compressor because I know nothing about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and chillers and all these things, it sounds like have to come with that. Right. And then how do I decide uh, how much bigger to go? Do I go to a 10 station, eight color, or do I go bigger than what I yeah. think I'll need so that sure. I have that in growth? Well, you know, what size press to get 
is really a matter of your work that you do, right? So have you done an audit on how many colors you typically print? So we're, we're I would call us a very small shop. So the majority of the things we print are two color with maybe an underbase. Okay, so so why do you need a thin 12, right? So like think, think about uh, what you're typically doing. Now, if you start doing a lot of higher color counts and different things, then you might need that, right? Also, uh, sometimes you need uh, stations for the flash unit, that's where I think right? One and then a cool down or a roller squeegee, and that all those take up the print heads, right? So that's that would add more stations to what you do, but I don't know what type of stuff you print. So I would be really it's standard. Yeah. I mean, so I'd be really looking at, at what you think you need, and to me, buy the best that you can afford right and also buy for the future right so we're doing this right now but what do you think you might need two or three years from now what type of clients you're going to go after what do they like to have right also you know what um uh you know you're in illinois that's uh, you know m and r is right up the road from you right so you can probably get a tech down real easy so something go wrong right so we're i always like to look at your service look at your warranty look at if you have something that, that was wrong, fixing that, you know, how do you do that? Are there texts in the area? Um, also, I am a big fan of all of the equipment that's in the shop is the same brand, whatever it is. Okay, it's Rock, it's MHM, it's m &R, whatever it is, because a lot of times you can switch the platens out. It's the same parts. It's the same training. You can get training on how to maintain your equipment. The problem with using different types um, is that uh, now you got to know three languages instead of one. Okay. And so I like doing everything the same, whether that's in embroidery, it could be Baradon or Tajima or a ZSK or whatever it is, right? You, or Happy or SWF, or there's a, like of, a million. Of right? embroidery machines and it's but it's do them all the same distract. because you've got hoops, you got a lot of stuff, right? So, um, but for, for you, you know, I would be looking also what's the footprint, right? Air compressor, your the manufacturer is going to recommend what you should get, right? Uh, and, uh, and go with what they have, right? And then also you might look at uh, do you have the right uh, three phase, right? You have electricity in your building, right? You, and so well, when just you're just recently bought the building, so I can control all of those things. Right. You know, I'm not reliant on I'm renting a space or leasing a space, yeah. and now I have to figure out what I can do. Right. I'm not really limited on that. I think my biggest concern is that I don't go too small or right. I don't go over. I don't need right. a Cadillac maybe to do the things that we're doing. Yeah. So I'm just not sure if that's, if going to the top of the line and way bigger than I need right away. Yeah. Well, just think if every we're once in a while you're going to have a high color count job, I bet there's people in this room would love to print that for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. If most of your stuff is only a couple colors, and that's your sweet spot, then that you know what the excision is, right? But if you're gonna start doing, you know, crazier work with more colors and different things, then you might look at that, right? You it, you have to decide what's right. And going my back to, uh, to wherever the other guy was with the business plan, right? That's it, it's the same thing there, right? Yeah. It's dictating your customers and their problems are gonna dictate the equipment that you're using to solve their problems, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Where in uh, Southern Illinois is she, Marshall? Okay, Alan wants to know where in Southern Illinois are you? Uh, we are in Breeze, Illinois, so it's about 50 Breeze? miles. Mm -hmm, is 50 that cool, miles. Breeze? It's where is it? There. 50 miles from what? Very breezy. Yeah. <laughs> um, where, where is it? 50 yeah, miles from what? Right. Okay, it's just east of St. Louis? Mm -hmm. right. I'm actually in Southern, Southern Illinois oh, next right. week, if she would like me to call her. What'd you say? I'm in no. Southern Illinois next week. In Springfield, in Peoria, I'm flying into oh, Alan Howell with Easy Way says he's in Southern Illinois next week. What? He, he would I'm love fine. to come by and visit if you'd like him to. Come on by. Uh, What's the name of the What's company? The name of your shop so A V H Ink and Vinyl. A V H Ink and Vinyl, Alan. Tell her just to give uh, the information to you or Richard. Yeah, he wants us to get your info. Awesome. Yeah, so you know we can. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Right. Who else has a question? Thank you. I guess we answered them all. How long does this thing go to? I don't know. We're 24 minutes over. Oh, we got one more question. Uh, 
everybody's been doing great. This has been awesome. Yeah. So, so I'd, I'd like talking to, know, to the mic, Peter. I'd like you. to know. Um, we do a Who lot is of the introduce? for embroidery. Pro probably eighty percent. I've got one six head, and I want. Well, this might answer itself. And now, and now we're doing a lot of uh, DTF stuff. Um, so we we have a DTG in house. Uh -huh. I just want to know what is the formula or when I should quit outsourcing make the jump and invest in equipment in house it's kind of a broad question because there's so many variables like yeah money well, space yeah, yeah. so uh, so what i would be doing is i would again i would go back to your business plan go back to your marketing plan how much work are you sending out what is that costing you if you bring it in house and you don't know actually how to do the work yet you're there's a learning curve there right so you might bring it in and do it on a smaller basis uh, and still outsource like 80% of it and 20% while we're learning or something or whatever. But I think you really need to look at what's the, when the pain is too great to outsource. That's when you bring it in house, right? I know people who will never bring it in house. I know people who have sold all their equipment completely and they're just brokering it because they know that that cost is going to be whatever it is. And it'll never increase because that's the cost. The problem with bringing it in house is that you think it's going to cost one thing and it might cost way more because of overtime and mistakes or whatever. Right. So there's a, it's a double edged sword there sometimes. Right. So I think what you really got to look at is just what makes sense for you. Right. And uh, what's your risk tolerance and what kind of equipment are you looking at? And do you have staff and labor? I and mean, then there's just, there's, there isn't a simple answer, Peter. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish there was yeah. right. Uh, and I, I, I'm sure all the equipment dealers on the show floor here would say, Hey, the time is today. <laughs> okay. But gonna, I think who's going to run the equipment for you. Who's going to run a DT fit up machine? Well, well I have. Any, someone to do it but oh back there yeah she's okay back there but it's she I've sounds like she's got other work that she's working on. well she might you have a spare time, time I, I probably have to hire another person to help i don't know there's all you know and 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 actually <laughs> am i gonna make more by doing it this way or is it just easier just out there that's uh, definitely business plan that's yeah, just mathematics yeah. Yeah. greg Kitson has a job the numbers to yeah paper so Here's where you hire alan or richard or marshall to sit with you for a couple of hours and work that sort of thing out. So Greg Kitson here on the on the show says, has a comment. It says his target is six per screen plus 10, 10 per minute. Therefore, a three color with an underbase and 300 shirts is 54 minutes total. And the next job is going up. We usually beat this target. So finding the right person, right? If you can't beat that and somebody else can, because it's all, it's all about yeah. the money, right? It's so- so like know your process and know what you're capable of whatever and maybe when you start you'll ne you won't hit that right off the bat right but set some goals right how do we get there right and just start looking at that stuff and what makes sense and decide you, this is the part of entrepreneurship right that we all love and hate is the fact that we have to make decisions okay we have to decide that i want to spend the money to do it and what we're all crossing our fingers that things are going to work out, right? That's the risk reward thing, right? And even contracting it out, right? You send it to somebody else. That doesn't mean they're going to do a good job. That doesn't mean they're going to do it on time, right? And, and uh, so there are people, even the best contract shops make mistakes, right? And, and, and they should back it up and redo it or whatever, right? But nobody's perfect, right? And But so it's like, you have to decide where your tolerance is for that. Okay. Greg Gibson has another comment. Right. And then Greg also says that he could not do this without a CTS system and a good pre-registration. Absolutely. So um, any last questions? Cause I think it's time to wrap up. All right. Well, uh, everybody that's still here, thank you so much for coming today. And uh, this is kind of, this is the first time we've ever done this live and virtual at the same time and thank you for putting up with our technical challenges because we really don't know what we're doing here it's and 
Everybody uh, online. Can Alex you close this out online? I will. Uh, everybody online, thank you for uh, uh, listening. Uh, we had some technical problems, but you know what? For the most part, it was great. Richard, we can still hear you. We have a little kinks to work out. For, for the most part, it was awesome. Tell everybody in class, thank you very much for coming. And we'll see you next week at 12 o'clock on Friday. So to our sponsors, I did play the commercial, Marshall, to Graphic Solutions and uh, at uh, gojsg.com. So uh, thank you so much. And everybody have a great week. And we're, week. we're out. Thanks.